Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Oh. This is the last night of this week. That's very good because this is the last night of this week. We are ending this week and the time flies because it is almost one week and two days in less than six days to end the course. So it's a very short time and it happened very fast. We are going to end this course in, in some days. So we are going to start with this session number 10. And yesterday we were um, seeing the strategies for the uh, reading process. And we had an exercise yesterday, but uh, we are going to um, wait for the others to do the exercise. So we are going to have a little uh, review of the, of the strategies. So we are going to see the document and then when we have more participants, we're going to do the exercise that is very simple. So uh, we have some strategies to improve the reading process and we have some information here and we have seven strategies for this uh, reading process. And uh, we have left two strategies to this, um, to improve the reading process or to know how to do it when we are learning a new language. So uh, we have the number one, that is the preview. When we read or um, in this case, it is guessing about the text or the things that we are going to read in a text and we use the headlines of the newspapers to uh, do this uh, strategy because we uh, guess what is the, the news about. Then the context. In this case, it's um, making questions to uh, enter in the context of the topic that the text is going to develop. Uh, making questions help us to understand what is the main topic of these news, these articles, or these books that we are going to read. And of course, it is um, to make us think about the thing that is happening that is in our country, in another country, or some things that happen in our life and that happens also in the books. Then we have number three, that is visualizing. In this case is imagine how these uh, places can be or also we can uh, create mental maps in our minds with the information that we are reading. And also it's uh, to create images about the places, the cities and all of the things to uh, help us to understand better the context, the topic or the story that we are reading. Then we have asking and answering, that is the number four, then in this case is to make questions about the story or the things that are happening in that moment. And it helps us to um, recollect more information about the things that we are reading. Then we have number five, that is a summarizing, that is the, uh, the ones that we, that we were um, studying, studying at the end of the session yesterday. That is, um, in this case, is to summarize the uh, things that we are reading. We are not going to tell the whole story when someone asks us um, what is the story about, what is the news about, what is the article about. We use some information to give the main points of the uh, news or the articles or the story that we are reading. And we um, look for details that help the people understand what is this story about. And yesterday we were uh, reading the Trojan War. That was a story about um, the things that happened in Troya that we can tell that is a story that 
almost everyone um, has something about because it's very common to see this when we are in the school. It is not something new because we have read something about that um, that story before. And in the website that uh, we were uh, reading the story, it has uh, some preview things that we uh, must know about the story. We have an audio for the ones that likes that kind of things. It has uh, some, some information about the Greek mythology, about Helen, uh, because it is very important to know who was Helen in that history. Also, uh, it talk about the judgment of Paris, who was Eris, the sources that was used in this story. Uh, also, it has the story that is the main part of this exercise. So for that exercise, you have to summarize in one sentence, what caused the Trojan War? One sentence to say what was the cause for the Trojan War? Una, una oración para eh, hacer esta, este resumen de qué fue lo que pasó y qué fue lo que causó la guerra de Troya. Well, teacher, um, as, as I have read, um, the, the war in Troya was because Helen ran away with um, Paris. And that was the cause of that war. Okay, that's, that's very good. It's a, it's a simple sentence. And that's the cause of the war in yeah. Troya because she was in, we can read that at the beginning of the, the website. It says, Helen was the most beautiful woman from the age of the heroes. So in that case, mm -hmm. Helen was a very, very, very beautiful woman and everyone in that moment wants to be married with her. So in that case, she was married with a very powerful man, but the, um, the goddess, because we have the goddess that was um, having a fight in a wedding, they decide that Paris needs to be with Helen. It was something uh, outside our hands. And in this case, she ran away, as you say, with Paris and let his, uh, her husband, that was a very uh, powerful man and begins the war and all of that things. Very good. Nice, nice uh, answer for this exercise. Then we have another one because we have um, seven and we are going to read the number six and number seven that are, and number seven that are the last ones for the strategies for the reading process. We have a scheming. This is a one a very useful strategy for the, the reading process. Also, we have the number seven that is just coming and we are going to see what these strategies are about. In the scheming, uh, it says that scheming and scanning are usually considered a speed reading skills. And we can say it is considered is consider a speed reading skill. So in this case, it is not like um, the way we read. In this case, this strategy is the way we react when we have an article to uh, look for information. Because this is a strategy that helps us to um, find uh, more quickly this kind of information. So it says, that they are considered a speed reading skills because uh, they are not used for intensive reading. They are not used for intensive reading. They are essential skill nonetheless, and students need to know that sometimes intensive reading is not necessary. When we are uh, reading uh, some articles, some texts, 
for an exam, for example. Uh, they uh, may call some questions about the text. And it says, for example, uh, what is the main topic of the text? Or what is the main topic of the paragraph number one? And also they ask us uh, a specific information. What is the name of the, maybe the princess? Um, when did she born or something like that? And when we have this kind of questions, it is not necessary to read the whole paragraph. It is not necessary to read the whole text. We can do this kind of things, skimming or scanning, to find that information without reading everything in the text. So a skimming, a text involves running your eyes over it quickly to get the main idea. It's to read quickly without stopping too much to understand the things that we are reading. So in this case, it's just for the main idea. It also allows you to identify which parts of a long text you might want to read more closely. Uh, this skill is particularly useful, for example, in this case, we can use it for business English uh, who have a read uh, to long reports that are several pages long. By skimming the report, they can still follow the gist and stop when they find something of particular interest to them. So in this case, the skimming is just to uh, give a quick view of the text and to find the parts that are important for us. Para esta parte del skimming es cuando nosotros leemos rápido todo el texto, o sea, no nos detenemos, solo lo leemos, y nos detenemos en las partes importantes, porque nos ayuda a identificar cuáles son esas partes que sí vamos a necesitar y cuáles son las que no vamos a necesitar. So in this case, it is not just um, the intensive reading of read every word that we have in the text, is to find the parts that we are going to use. And uh, we have an example that uh, it is just to read. It says, when we are doing uh, this kind of a strategy, we can do something like this. We can hand out different magazines or newspapers and tell the people that are in classes that they have five minutes, just imagine that, five minutes to skim one. And after they are done skimming, the teacher or the, the person in charge ask them what stories they remember reading. So imagine that you have a newspaper and you have five minutes to read the whole newspaper. And then they ask you, which ones do you remember? In this case, you are not going to read everything because there are news that are not important. So you have to read and find what are the most interesting stories on the newspaper. Para estos ejercicios son con tiempo. Se le da una revista, se le da un, un periódico y se le dice, tienen cinco minutos para leerlo todo. Solo imagínense que le digan, tienen cinco minutos para leerlo todo. In your mind, you will uh, think, what? It is not possible because I am a slow reader. Porque acuérdense que todos tenemos diferentes maneras de leer, rápido, lento, eh, intermedio, leyendo los detalles, etc. So in this case, skimming is something that will help us to find the best uh, stories in the newspaper. Because we know that there are a lot of things in a newspaper or in a magazine so we can find that, uh, that points that are best for us. Then we have the scanning. That is the second one, a scanning. In this case, it's the second uh, strategy that is considered a speed reading skill. So in a scanning, on the other hand, allows you to quickly search a text for a particular piece of information. A scanning is ideal when students need to find a phone number in a directory, uh, the date of a historical event of the time their train is leaving. And in this case, in a scanning is just for a specific information. It is not to find the best points of the news or the articles. In this case, is for a specific information. 
And we are going to do like this. Look for a specific information in a text. For example, a phone number the date of a historical event, the time their train is leaving. So in a scanning, Eh, para esto de scanning es cuando necesitamos encontrar información de manera rápida. Eh, nos están pidiendo la fecha de la Segunda Guerra Mundial and we have a very long text about the Second War, eh, World War and we have to find the dates, the important dates. So in that case, we are not going to read. We are going to look for the date, the numbers. In that case, we are searching the numbers and then when we find uh, a number, we are going to read the uh, sentences that are with the date. So in that case, we have the answer. In this case, it's not um, like reading for understanding. This is reading for finding. Esto es para leer, no para entender lo que estamos leyendo, sino leer para encontrar. Yeah, a specific information that we need to solve some uh, questions, to solve some uh, things that we have in our daily life. And it is very useful also when we want to uh, find a specific information in things that we are doing in our daily life, like the dates um, in the medicine or um, the day for a, a day with the doctor, uh, something like that. So those are the strategies that are going to use in the reading process. There are seven, and they will help us to improve our reading skills because in some cases we think that it's better to read everything, but in some cases it is not because in, in some cases we just need some information to, um, to complete some task. In, when we are reading for fun, it's we have the time, but when we are reading for uh, doing something, we don't have enough time to do it because um, it's very uh, relaxing to have time to read a book or to read a magazine or to read an article that is very um, interesting for us. But in some cases, we don't have that time to do it. So in these cases, we are going to use the strategies for the reading skill. So we have seven and we have um, explained all of them. So then um, I will send you the, the, the seven um, strategies, so don't worry. Now we are going to end this week with this topic. Let's see. This is the topic that we are going to develop. And in this case, we are going to do a review because we have uh, learned something about this topic before. But in this case, we're going to talk about um, the whole tenses. And the topic is verb tenses. Vamos a hablar de los tiempos. Vamos a hablar de los tiempos que utilizamos para eh, los verbos. So in this case, we have eh, learned something about all these tenses, the present, the past, and the future. So in this case, it is just like a review of the topic. It is not very complicated because we already eh, studied this because it is eh, it begins from basic to intermediate, so don't worry. So verbs come in three tenses, that is very simple. Verbs come in three tenses, past, present, and future. That's the first part.
and future. The past is used to describe things that have already happened. We are going to divide it like this. The past is used to describe things that, um, that have already happened. That's very simple. Primero, tenemos que los verbos vienen en tres diferentes tiempos. Pasado, presente, futuro. That's very simple. Then, we have the number one. The past is used to describe things that have already happened. Tenemos que el pasado, obviamente, describe las cosas que ya pasaron. Then, we have the present tense. Is used to describe Things that are happening right now. Now, number two, the present tense is used to describe, describe things that are happening right now. El presente lo utilizamos para describir cosas que están pasando en este momento. And Teacher. tell me. Hello? Teacher, cook the voice. Señal. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I, I have gray uh, internet signal. I don't know what happened. Everyone can hear me? Yes, teacher. Yes, yes teacher. Yes. Yes, okay. yes, I can. I will do something because I don't know if this uh, some kind of problems. I will change the internet because I don't know if that problem of the internet. So give me a, a second. I will change for my... I don't listen. You don't listen, you don't hear my voice. Someone else with that problem? So let me change, give me a second. Okay, I think we are not going to have any problem right now, I guess. Okay, I think now it's going to be okay. Eh, ¿Ya no se escucha mal? Porque alguien decía que se escuchaba cortado. Right. No, now is it right? No, everything. Ya se le oye bien. Okay, okay, okay. Uh-huh. Okay, I think that it's uh, we are not going to have any problems. Okay, now let's summarize. Uh, we are talking about the verb tenses, and we have past, present, and future. We have uh, in this moment two uh, of these tenses: the past and the present. And the past is used to describe things that have already happened, and the present is used to describe things that are happening right now. So we are going to uh, talk about the future because it's the third one. And it says that um, the future tense describes describes things that are, have yet to happen. So in this case, the future is things that are going to happen in some time in the future. 
Así que el futuro es para describir cosas que no han pasado todavía, pero que lo más seguro es que lleguen a pasar o que nosotros queremos que pasen. So, in this case, we are going to have a table that illustrates the proper use of verb tense. We are going to have these like examples to see uh, how can we use them in some examples or of sentences that we can use. So we are going to do it like this, and we are going to create the table. We have the three uh, tenses with the examples. We have here the uh, present, the simple present. Then we have the simple past. And we have simple future. In this case, we are not going to uh, use the, um, the past perfect, the past continuous, the past perfect continuous, or the present perfect, the present continuous, or present perfect continuous, and all of that. In this uh, table, we are going just to have the simple present, simple past, and simple future. That is the uh, easy ones because in this case, it's the easy ones, because we already studied that, then we are going to develop the other um, tenses that have each of these main tenses. So in the first one, we have, I read nearly every day. I read, in this case, the verb is in present without any change, nearly every day. Then we have the simple past. Last night I read. An entire novel. And in the simple future, I will read. I will read as much as I can this year. This last sentence sounds like me because I say that every year. I will read as much as I can this year, but it's not possible in some cases. So in this case, simple, simple, simple. In the simple present, we are going to use the verb in the base form because we are using it for the present. That is structure is very simple. We have the subject, we have the verb, we have the complement. And in the past, also is very simple because we have uh, in this sentence, the word last night that um, let us know that we are going to talk about the past, something that happened. And in the future, we are using a day auxiliary that is will. Then we can create another sentence. For example, you, and we are going to use the verb be, you are beautiful. Then this, uh, you were my best friend. You will be my classmate. And are very simple sentences. Nothing um, hard to understand. But now we are going to have a little uh, sneak peek of the uh, present continuous, present perfect, and all of that. We have in this case, in the present continuous, because we are going to develop the uh, topic, we have this structure, present continuous, and we are going to have the past continuous. and future continues. Okay, we have this. And in this sentence, we're going to have something like this. I am reading. In this case, we are using the ing form of the verb. 
The ing form of the verb are the continuous part of these um, tenses. So in that case, we have the change in the verb that is the ing to create the continuous. I am reading Shakespeare. at the moment. Then in the past, I was reading, also using the ing form. I was reading Edgar Allan Poe. Last night. And for the future continuous, I will be reading. I will be reading. Nathaniel Hawthorne soon. So this one is also very simple to understand because in this case, we are just going to change the verb with the ing form and nothing else. Then, but in this case, we're going to have uh, the use of the verb be. Add, um, then we have the uh, ing form of the, of the verbs. Para la parte del continuo, del presente continuo, pasado continuo y futuro continuo, es el uso del verbo to be más el verbo con la forma ing al final. That's very simple. Then we have, Present perfect. Past perfect. And future perfect. And we have these examples. I have Read so many books I can keep count. I have read so many books I can keep count. In this case, it's the use of have in the sentences. I have read. When they say I have read at least 100 books by the time I was 12. And in the future, I will have read at least 500 books by the end of the year. So in this past, pre um, present, past and future perfect is the use of have and had for the sentences. So in the simple present is to use just the verb and the, and the Present continuous is to change the verb, adding ing at the end of the verb. And in the present perfect is to use have. In that case, it marks the present perfect, the use of have. And we have the last one that is present perfect continuous. We have present perfect continuous, past perfect continuous, and future perfect continuous. In this case, is the use of have been. I have been reading since I was four years old.
In past, I have been reading for at least a year before my sister And in future, we have, I will have been Okay. I will mark the structure for these uh, tenses. In the first one, this case is the, um, the verb in base form without changes. And then we have in present continuous, the verb that are changing with the ing form. Then in the present perfect, we have have. Then we have in the, pre the present perfect continuous, have been in the ing form of the verb. Those are the structures for these, um, these tenses. So in this case, we can see this verb like um, the same with the simple uh, present, but the pronunciation is different. And when we uh, see the last night, we know that in this case, we are not going to, to say, I read an entire novel because we are not talking about the present. In this case, we are talking about the past. And we are going to say, I read an entire novel because we are uh, talking about the past. Then I was reading in this case because we are using the verb be to uh, create this kind of sentence. And in this case, had, because it's the past of have, and past present continuous had been reading. And also in future, this is the structure because we are going to use the auxiliary for the future actions. We'll be reading, we'll have, we'll have been. Those are the structures that we are going to use for these tenses, very simple. So, esas son las estructuras que estamos utilizando con el verbo, porque estamos hablando de los tiempos del verbo. Y son esos que tenemos marcados ahí, el verbo en forma simple, ya sea en pasado. En eh, pasado solo se pasan al, al, a la versión del pasado del verbo. En el futuro, pues obviamente utilizamos el auxiliar, que es el que nos da la pauta para saber que estamos hablando del futuro. En present continuo, solo es agregarle el i ng al final del de verbo y en el caso de presente, pasado y futuro siempre vamos a utilizar el verbo to be. En present perfect es el uso del have en el pasado, pues es el had y en el futuro will have. Because also we are going to use uh, will with all of these tenses. El presente, el presente perfecto continuo solo es el uso del have been con el, la forma ing del verbo. And those are the examples. So we have the three uh, the three tenses that are the tenses that we are seeing in in the table, and we have uh, four parts for each one because we have in the past tenses we have the simple past, the past perfect, the past continuous, and we have the past perfect continuous. As in the past, in the present, we have the simple present, the present perfect, the present continuous, and the present perfect continuous. And in the future, again, we have simple future, future perfect, future continuous, and future perfect continuous. We are going to divide the tenses in the times. So we have number one, because we are in order, the past tenses. And we have a simple past. 
That's the first of this tense, the simple past. And it says, the simple past is a verb tense that is used to talk about things that happened or existed before and now. Imagine someone asks what your brother um, Santiago did while he was in town last weekend. So in this tense, it's something that happened in a previous time. And we have an example. Santiago entered a hula hop contest. So in this case, this is our verb, entered. And at the end of the verb, we have the ed that marks that the verb is in past. And also we have another one and it says, he won the silver medal. One is our verb in past, that is the past of win. So we have two things here. We have a regular and irregular verbs. Tenemos los verbos regulares y los irregulares that we have studied here before, that we have in the regular ones that they don't change as much their um, structure, but in the irregular ones, we change the structure of the verb. So in the first case, Santiago entered a hula hop contest is a regular verb. And in the second one, he won the silver medal is a irregular verb because it changed the form of the verb. So the simple past tense shows that you are talking about something that has already happened. Unlike the past continuous tense, which is used to talk about past events that happen over a period of time, the simple past tense emphasize that the action is finished. So in this case, in the simple past, we have that if this action is finished. En el present, en el pasado simple, sabemos que la acción ya terminó. No hay más de esa acción. Por eso es pasado simple. Then, you can also use the simple past to talk about a past state of being, such as the way someone felt about something. This is often expressed with the simple past tense of the verb to be in an adjective, noun, or prepositional phrase. También lo podemos utilizar, ¿verdad? Para hablar del estado de el ser. With the verb be, an adjective, a noun, or a prepositional phrase. And in this case, we can uh, use like this. Santiago, we are going to use the past uh, of the verb be, was proud. This is the adjective of his hula nice. hop victory. Okay, he was proud of his hula hop victory, the state of being. The contest was the highlight of his week. Was, and we have again the verb be in past. The highlight of his week. And we are going to have the formula of the simple past. For regular verbs, we are going to add ed uh, to the root form of the verbs or just d if the root form already ends in an e. Para crear la, el verbo, solo vamos a agregar ed al final y en algunos casos solo la d porque ya traen la e al final del verbo. So, in this case, uh, we are going to create the verbs like this.
And we have some examples. We have play and we change to play in like this. Then we have type. In this case, the verb end with an E. So we are going just to add the D at the end. Then we have listen. Then we have push. And we have love. This is for the regular ones. It is not for irregulars. Then we have the irregulars that it says, things get more complicated. The simple past tense of some irregular verbs look exactly like the root form. In some cases, when we um, see the verbs, we can find that some verbs in present are the same in past. But also in this case, we are going to know that um, what is the tense of the verb because of the context of the sentence. And in that case, we need to put attention to the uh, context of the, the sentence to know it is past or present. Or irregular. So we have the examples here. We have, this is the present and this is the past. It's the same. present and the past are uh, written in the same way. So for other irregular verbs, including the verb to be, the simple past form are more erratic because it changed. In this case, when we have the irregular verbs, we change the form of the verbs. And we have some examples. We have C and it changed to so. Then we have build to build. We have go and change to when. We have do the change to D. Rice, rose. Um, is and are change to was and were. So in that cases, these uh, verbs change their form because there are irregulars and have this special characteristic. The good news is that the verbs in the simple past tense, except for the verb to be, don't need to agree in number with the subject. In this case, when we are using the verbs, the irregular verbs, uh, or the, the regular verbs is that they don't have to 
agree in number because we have the uh, singular and plural. So in this case, it is not like that. That is necessary to uh, agree with the number because in these cases, we mark um, that they are in past. Eh, si sí sabemos que tenemos reglas para el, el singular y el plural, pero en este caso con estos verbos en pasado no es necesario que estén eh, de acuerdo con el número de participantes o el número de cosas que vamos a mencionar. So, in this case, eh, it says how to make the simple past negative. Uh, it says that there is a formula for making simple past verbs negative. It is, and it's the same for both regular and irregular verbs, except for the verb to be. The formula for creating negative sentences. We have the formula is did, in this case, did not plus root form of the verb. So in this case, we know that at the beginning of the sentence, we need the subject. But in this case, we're just uh, telling the, the negative form of the verb. In this este case, we are not going to use the verb in a, in past, like the, the things that we were saying in the list. We are going to use the did not to mark that the sentence is in negative form. And in this case, the, um, the verb is not going to change because we already have something that let us know that we are using the negative form. Para las oraciones negativas, cuando utilizamos el did not, in that case, es el que nos marca a nosotros que la oración está en negativa. Ya teniendo esa parte en negativa, no vamos a cambiar el verbo, porque ya tenemos algo que nos indica que la oración es negativa. For the verb to be, you don't need the auxiliary did. Eh, when the subject of the sentence is singular, is eh, you are going to use was not, and when the subject is plural, we use we are uh, were not. So in this case, we are not going to use the did not when we are using the verb to be. Cuando usamos el verbo to be, no vamos a utilizar el auxiliar did not, sino que simplemente utilizamos el was y el were según el número de personas que tengamos en la oración. How to ask question? We have the formula for the, um, the questions. Did plus the subject plus the root form of the verb. We already know that in the questions, we change the uh, order of the words in a sentence. In a simple sentence, we have the subject plus the, mm, the negative form or the auxiliary did not plus the root form of the verb, plus the complement. In this case, we are going to change the auxiliary at the beginning of the sentence, and we have did plus the subject, plus the root form of the verb. And we have the example. We can do it like this. Uh, Santiago, in this case, we are going to do it negative, did not win the medal. And for the question, we are going to change. Did Santiago win the medal? So in this case, the auxiliary goes at the beginning of the sentence to create the question. When asking a question with the verb to be, you don't need the auxiliary did. So in the case that we are using the verb to be, we are not going to use they did, we are going to use was or where.
For example, was Santiago in a good mood after the contest? Was Santiago in a good mood after the contest? Then we have the past perfect tense. This is the second part of the past tenses. So it says the past perfect, also called the flu perfect, is a verb tense used to talk about actions that were completed before some point in the past. Este past perfect tense es usado para hablar de acciones que fueron completadas eh, a cierto punto en el pasado. So, the past perfect tense is for talking about something that happened before something else. Imagine waking up one morning and stepping outside to grab the newspaper. On your way back in, in you notice a mysterious message scrawled across your front door. Thoughtless was here. When you are telling this story to your friends later, how would you describe this moment? You might say something like, I turned back to the house and saw that some and someone's name total has deficit my front door. So in this case, we are talking about things that happen in a specific point. In addition to feeling indignant on your behalf, your friends will also be able to understand that thoughtless graffiti at the door at some point in the past before the moment this morning when you saw his handiwork because you use the past perfect tense to describe the misdeed. And what's the formula for this uh, tense? So we are going to see. Had plus past participle. So in this case, we are not going to use the root, uh, the root form of the verb. We are going to use the past participle. It doesn't matter if the subject is singular or plural. In this case, we are not going to use the rules for the singular and plurals. And the uh, formula doesn't change. When we are going to use the past perfect, what's the difference between past perfect and simple past? When you are talking about some point in the past and want to reference an event that happened even earlier, Using the past perfect allows you to convey the sequence of the events. It's also clearer and more specific. Consider the difference between these two sentences. And we have the number one. We were relieved that Toodles use washable paint. With, we were relieved that Toothless had used washable paint. In some cases, we are going to say that the uh, past perfect tense help us to give a list of events that happen in some time. And it's simple past uh, doesn't do that because it just talk about the actions. It is a subtle difference, but the first sentence doesn't tie toothless act of using washable paint to any particular moment in time. Readers might interpret the as we were relieved that Toothless was in the habit of using, of using washable paint. In the second sentence, the past perfect makes it clear that you are talking about a specific instance of using washable paint. So in that case, we are uh, giving the reader more information about the time, a something or someone did something. So we are going to uh, stop here with the tenses and we are going to continue on Monday because it's time to end the session. This is the last day of this week. Remember that you have to work in the platform because it's where we can uh, see the progress of your work and have a great, great, great weekend.
and we are going to see each other on Monday. So good night, everyone, and see you on Monday. Good night. 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 Good night.